Our next guest, Jim Bell. Can you get it, Jim? No, I cannot. This is four. Yeah, from the 50s, Johnny and the Hurricanes beat Nick Fly. <laughs> right? little no words whatsoever. Just It is the tune it. from Jimmy Crack Corn. It kind of sounds a little bit yeah. like Jimmy Crack Corn. I don't care. Which right? I don't think you're allowed to sing anymore, actually. Probably, <laughs> probably oh, I don't correct. care. <laughs> Jimmy doesn't either. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Hey, this segment of our show today brought to you by Parsons Ford of Martinsburg. We became number one by making you number one first. By the Skinner Accident and Injury Attorneys at SkinnerWins.com. Also by Larry DeMarco and Company at Century 21 Modern Realty Results. And by P.J. Orsini and Orsini's Home Store, not just an appliance store any longer. At 360 Hank Wilson Way, Martinsburg, and at Orsini's.com. Uh, returning to co-host in this segment, Mr. John Gilstrap, New York Times bestselling author who's got company this morning on that title list. Mr. Good Gilstrap. Jefferson County Prosecuting Attorney Matt Harvey. Mr. Harvey. Good morning. Hey, um, what's better than one New York Times bestselling author? Doubling it? Double your Two fun? Two New York Times bestselling <laughs> authors. Double your fun? <laughs> double your author fun? Double your pleasure, double your fun. Right? Yeah, like the Doubleman twins. You guys it would That's be the back. male version of that, I guess. Okay. Yeah, it is going back to that. I don't know what year the Doubleman twins were. That's going to be like, what, 80s, 70s? Even, even further, I think. You think? Yeah. Yeah, Jim, move a little closer to your microphone there. there, you, there How's you that? Go. That's almost that good. better? Know, almost you're you're good. too tall for the, for the short microphone. Pretend you're, the... pretend you're back in front of a jury. Oh, okay. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> believe every word I say. <laughs> Uh, so when we do these uh, segments here with, uh, we call them FOJs, Friends of John, we ask him to do the intros. Uh, Jim Bell, James Scott Bell is his, his writing name. He's been a buddy of mine for a long time. Uh, we share a blog, actually. Uh, it's called the Killzone blog. He's, he, he posts every Sunday on killzoneblog.com. I'm every other Wednesday, and I'm, and I'm not actually every other Wednesday sometimes. <laughs> um but Jim is he's a jack of all trades in, in terms of his career. He's a recovering lawyer. In fact, I, I didn't even know this. I was going through your website. You, uh, your book on search and seizure law is the leading authority in its field and used extensively by lawyers and judges. I didn't even know you had written a law book. Um, it, it, your, your home is your uh, castle, well, man. I'll, I'll tell you, my, it was my dad who started the book. And it became a you know, huge bestseller for, for lawyers and judges and law enforcement. And uh, when he died, I took it over and have been running it really since 1988. And it's still going. And uh, Cindy, my because wife. Because you, yeah. you have to constantly update it. Yeah, it, every, uh, every two months we update on the law and the changes. And I do a little digest for the lawyers and whoever that want to find the information very quickly. Uh, based on, you know, they were arguing in court, let's say, and they need to find a case that'll help them. Boom, boom, boom. You can find it in the physical book or online. And search so. and see. Anyone who's ever been stopped in a traffic violation Absolutely. claims to know search and seizure yes. laws. <laughs> <laughs> Claim, I, claims to. I'm, I'm, what is it? I'm a citizen of the world. I'm a, what is the, 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 Do the judges use it like a bench book? or is Yeah, it the just, judges will use it. Um, in fact, during the O.J. Simpson uh, murder trial, uh, the preliminary hearing judge used my book to find a case to hold against the defense in the, uh, there was a search issue uh, regarding the police going into the Rockingham based on, you know, a, a trail of blood and so forth, but uh, at the other location. So the, the lawyers were arguing about it and there was a case that she cited that neither side had seen before. So. It, it comes in handy, and judges... Were you, were you screaming at the TV, like, you cite this case, cite this case, uh, you're missing it? Uh, no, I wasn't really. I was just kind of sitting back and seeing what they would do. Um, I knew a couple of the lawyers on the defense team and a couple of more subscribers of mine, so I need to write them a nasty note to say, why didn't you find this? But anyway, <laughs> no, it, uh, it was an amazing time, and... Uh, you know, I was on ABC, Good Morning America, and I uh, Newsweek, so I had a little, you know, blip of uh, OJ uh, trial fame. Oh my, that but put a lot of attorneys to a, work. A lot of them became second careers. Oh yeah, yeah. That, and that that also launched the career of the Kardashians because of Bobby Kardashian. So two bad things came out of that trial: <laughs> OJ not guilty and the Kardashians. <laughs> right. And then you went. You you pivoted to to writing fiction mm -hmm. first, traditionally published fiction, yes. and then before we get to the other side of that, and the and then you started writing and teaching other people how to write. Correct. And your your book, plot and structure, 
has is the Writer's Digest books. Writer's Digest is the Bible for people who want to learn how to write. And his, his, his uh, book, Plot and Structure, is the number one best-selling book ever on for Writer's Digest books. So Jim has these, these multiple careers. He left the world of traditional publishing, and that was as the, one of very few people I know that has carved out a very successful career in independent publishing or self-publishing. So welcome to the show. Oh, that was a lovely introduction. I'm here. I'm glad to be here. So before we get into the business of writing, tell us about the latest book. Is it Romeo's Fire? Tell Romeo's us about Fire. Mike Ro Romeo and about the book. Well, I have a series, a series character, as you do, John. And I want to actually have a question for you about that. But uh, this is the ninth book in the series. Uh, he's it, It's the lone wolf tradition, kind of uh, an old west hero, but in modern times. I, I kind of based him upon or was really influenced by the characters I love. So really, Philip Marlowe from Raymond Chandler and Dirty Harry and uh, Paladin from an old TV Western called Have Gun, Will Travel. Mm -hmm. He was probably the biggest influence because uh, Mike Romeo is someone who can fight and do all of those things. However, he prefers to use his mind which Paladin always did to, and his culture and his background, because he's a, a scholar, to disarm people. But then, you know, he has a saying, um, you know, speak softly, but carry a big fist. So if, if the talk doesn't work, he's always ready to uh, go the other direction. And he's usually trying to talk the, to the bad guys, saying, you don't want to do this, and giving them like classical allusions to, and, they, and it, it kind of freaks them out, but that's one way of disarming them. So. He is a great character, fun to write, and uh, I'm going to keep on, on going. Now, I want to ask you, John, you know, there are two types of series characters. There's a, a character who can change and transform over a series of books, and there are those who, like Sherlock Holmes or Jack Reacher, tend to stay the same book to book. How would you characterize Grave in that regard? He pretty much stays the same. Yeah. He's, um, I don't want him to evolve. He, He's the lead character, but it's really, he's, he does hostage rescue for the most part. So that's where the story is. The story arc is with the people he's rescuing. Yes. He's kind of mm -hmm. the, he's, he's the fixed point in space right. that does what he does. So And ba Harry Bosch is one who does change and transform. So it's a different feel for the series. Now, I personally, I like that. So that's what I'm doing with Romeo is that he does change and, and yet stays the same. Mm -hmm. So... It's kind of fun. It's a fun challenge. The balance for your readers who are used to the character being one way as he changes, do you get any feedback about that? They like it. They like it. In fact, they I will get letters saying, I hope he I hope in the next book he overcomes that uh, or deals with that. And so I I kind of take that expectation in, into mind when I do it. And uh, but yet he still remains the action hero that I originally wanted to be so. I, I want to ask you about the name Mike Romeo. That that automatically kind of makes one's mind go to that he's you know a, a successful with the ladies or some sort of playboy type <laughs> character. Is that like a, a purposeful like distraction or? Well, the that's not his original name. He has a background that is one of the secrets that is revealed in the first book and why he's in Los Angeles living, you know, off the grid and so forth. But he, at one point, he be became a cage fighter, MMA cage fighter. And instead of using his real name, because he was actually running from the law at that point, he changed his name to Romeo. Now, it was the reason he did Romeo was not for the ladies, but because he's a classics expert, and he was just basing it on a Shakespearean uh, vibe so Mike Romeo and it sounded good for the cage matches so that's really how it came about oh, it's interesting yeah but that's that's if I was on the run from the law I wouldn't pick a name like Romeo that just kind of sticks with you it makes you more memorable well oh hey you know good question but uh, I disagree no I I, I, I don't know I, no, it wasn't really a question no it was, it was he established a different identity as Romeo that was so different from what his previous profile was that it, 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 someone looking at him then would say, that's not the same, that couldn't be the same guy. And he didn't leave a trail. So 
that was just a way for him to kind of publicize himself when he was a fighter for the for the cage matches. But then he left that and ended up in Los Angeles, which is where most of the book take place because that's where I grew up. Uh, I love the city. Uh, I love the history of it. There's a lot of great noir neighborhoods and so forth that you can play with. Uh, so I, I do that in pretty much every book. He goes on location. He, he went to San Francisco once and you know, tore that town apart. Does the time change in, as, uh, as the books go along? Do you, do you move from one decade to another or are these mostly in the same kind of time? Well, it's, it's, a contem- it's always a contemporary setting mm-hmm. and I will use what's happening in the culture perhaps at that time. For instance, when you know, COVID hit and everybody was walking around with masks in Los Angeles and things were pretty restricted, uh, I actually used that as part of the story. And the reason I did that is I like to have these books capture a, a certain time, mm-hmm. capture a certain vibe uh, in the culture and preserve that. And it kind of makes the books sort of historically accurate for people that go back and read them later. And it captures that that essence. So, yeah, I, I now I don't really age the character which is always a question when people do series characters like this. Uh, and I think John is similar in terms of, you're not tracking his age as Jonathan Grave goes along. No. And, you know, who really regrets doing that is Michael Mike Connelly. Connelly. yeah. He decided that Bosch, he was going to age him for, with, with each book chronologically. And so when Bosch gets into his 60s, it's sort of like, well, I'm sorry I did that. Well, he, he had no idea, and he'll tell you this, Mike, he had no, nobody thinks... Um, Harry Bosch is the the series character. Nobody thinks he, a series is going to run as long as the Harry Bosch series has run. So he's now like seventy, yeah. and he's an LA cop. <laughs> yeah. yeah, how much copying can you, you do? Retired, when yeah. he, when well, he went he went private. Yeah, so now, now he's a consultant, <laughs> and, and he's still <laughs> yeah. making it work. And 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 Michael Connelly is a very good uh, author. I am trying to find the name of of your character because you uh, Rob grew up through Catholic schools, and you have a butt kicking nun. Oh, in, 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 as one of your series I think characters, I met her, yeah. and I, I can't, I can't pull her out. So tell All us right. about that. Well, years ago, my son, who is a wordsmith and uh, loves playing with words, came up to me. He said, "Dad, why don't you write a series about a vigilante nun, and we'll call it Force of Habit?" <laughs> <laughs> and he he laughed, and I said, "You know, that's really kind of a fun <laughs> idea." So I went ahead and I wrote it. I wrote a novella about. Uh, a nun named Sister Justitia Marie, who has, has established her own order, the Sisters of Perpetual Justice, in Los Angeles. I like that. And her backstory is that she was a child actress that got very popular and then was trained in uh, martial arts for, for movies, and but then had this conversion and became a nun. And then... As she is helping people in Los Angeles, uh, the down and out, you know, she naturally encounters criminals. And she kicks their butts. And the, you know, the Catholic Church hierarchy is wondering, wait, is this proper for a nun to do? And her argument is, well, I'm stopping sin. I'm stopping this man from killing somebody and committing a worse sin. And so they have these kind of fun dialogues about about that, but the, each of the, the, the books has a, a title like um, uh, Force of Habit 2, um, and then there were nuns. Uh, <laughs> Force of Habit 3, the nun also rises. <laughs> and That's awesome. Force of Habit 4, hot cross nuns. Okay, so we go on. <laughs> My wife helped me with the title, so. That's great. That's I'm like sure the, that that's pretty popular then. Well, it, it is. I have, a, I have a nice fan base for that. It's, it's all in a collection now. Uh, on my website, it's called you know, Force of Habit, and uh, it's it's available on Amazon. Well, if too. you need any insight or ideas as to how nuns used to torture kids, let me know. I can I'd be glad to help you get some uh, scenes. Uh, they, they, you don't know what they were stopping, Rob, but they do. They, they, they were, were they were stopping you. sin. That's what they, they were, were stopping doing. you. Rob. They were stomping. Yeah. They were stomping out <laughs> sin is what they were doing. Yeah. Uh, hey, those nuns in those days were tough, man. Oh yeah, right. They Old school. They didn't take anything, right? So I got a, I got a question for you. As a, I got two writers in the room, so I ask the question here now. As a successful writer, do you have to be a great observer of culture, the modern culture? 
Well, I don't think it hurts. Um, you're always observing people mm -hmm. and people make up culture. So I think inevitably that happens in my books when I'm writing about uh, bringing in certain characters that are representing the dark side or you know the, the villain side. There is inevitably to me that the characters that you run into are going to represent certain cultural shifts. And so I don't avoid those. Um, I don't make I don't make them overt in terms of trying to be polemical about it, but it just happens naturally, I think, as you observe. And this is ha as I would do in life, as I encounter people and hear what they're about. It's the same thing. So I, I it just happens naturally for me. I just work it in. How about you? I think people who are are writers or artists, I would think graphic artists, you know, being able to paint or stuff. I think they just naturally absorb what's around them they're observers of of stuff you mm -hmm. know and whether it's sounds or gestures or yeah i, I don't think it's intentional well your I former profession happened. as well true as, as a defense attorney correct yeah. you had to you have to you were forced people. to kind of uh i don't want to say forced but you um defended someone's rights and so mm -hmm. you kind of had to be understand their perspective true yeah you have to understand people on the jury and elsewhere too yeah witnesses so can anybody learn how to write a book <laughs> all right john you and your loaded <laughs> well <questions>. obviously <laughs> oh, uh, yeah. there you go yeah I, look when i <clears throat> i didn't know how to write a book i did not know i mean i i knew what a story was i could look at it but i didn't know how these authors did it i thought they just sat down at a typewriter and just typed it out and it was it was perfect and I, I was very naive about that. And then when I was in college, I was told by professors, you, you cannot learn to write. You, you're either born with it or you're not. You know, and I, I, obviously I wasn't because I was, it, none of it was working. So, but after about 10 years of believing what I call the big lie that you can't learn, um, my wife and I went to a double feature. We saw uh, Wall Street and Moonstruck. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know what Moonstruck was. I, I went to see Wall Street. But Moonstruck blew me away. I yeah. love that movie. It's so original and, and so affecting. And I, I came out and I said, I want to be able to make people feel that way. So I'm going to try to get back into writing and see if I can learn it. And so I'd been to law school, and so I tackled it like a subject. I, you know, I got the Writer's Digest books, and I studied, and I highlighted, and I practiced. Eventually, it clicked, and I had learned to take another step. And then... I got traditionally published. I worked with some great editors, and they helped me get another step. And so when I wrote my book, Plot and Structure, and I was writing articles for Writer's Digest, it was to tell people that, yeah, I did this. I learned how, and these are the tools that I use, and you, you if you understand them, you can use them too. So anybody can learn to write a book, a competent book. How do you get to that next level? That's where the talent comes in, the vision, the voice, uh, your passion. And uh, another thing I try to do with writers is help them to you know, unleash what's within them and not hold it back, but put it into a structure that readers can understand. So, yes. How about that? Okay. <laughs> I disagree. Okay. But, but we've had this discussion many times that I, I, I agree with you. I think any... I'm of your professor's point of view. I think that you, people are either born with the ability to tell a story or they're not. And then not everybody knows what to do with the skill. Mm -hmm. It's like there are people who naturally are musicians mm -hmm. and with that natural ability can then become really good pianists or whatever it is. But the, the people who are forced to take piano lessons can be very competent piano players, but will not become... Well, excellent pianist. It's sort of interesting. Well, another way to look at it is uh, I had a friend in high school that we all thought was a literary genius. I mean, he was always writing stuff that was wonderful, and the teachers loved it. And we all thought, okay, this guy's going to be a literary star. And he never, he never went out to try to develop that. He, I mean, he did try some things, but he didn't get there. And one of the reasons, I think, is that he was so natural at it he thought it should be that way all the time but i mean yeah even you know mm -hmm. ramsey lewis had to learn the scales on the piano before he started riffing the way he does so you there's a there's a certain window that everybody has i believe of talent and of ability and somehow it's higher for some and 
uh, not so high for others, but you can t you can learn things that will take you to the limit of where you want to want to be and get better at it. Uh, so it doesn't mean that you're going to write a bestseller every every time, but the elements of how to how to do that you can learn and try to apply them is my theory. And you're a great coach and a great teacher. Well, and people thank you. people love your books. I mean, you see that the the praise you get on the kill zone from people who have read your stuff and love your stuff and you have made careers you have so yeah and i like i like to teach i like i've done a lot of teaching at workshops and so forth as have you now let's let me ask you you as someone with your theory why do you go and teach i teach people what works for me and i have a slide that says no one can teach you how to write oh okay so <laughs> oh, God. we got to co-teach sometime <laughs> be be fun. you're either be a fun. writer or you're not is what yeah. you're saying john yeah. john jill uh, goes job uh, jim's uh, hang out we've got a final uh, minute coming up here on the program after we do our last break of the show thanks to our guest uh, james scott bell author and uh where can we find your work sir the hub is jamesscottbell.com and you can find all my writing books, all my novels, uh, my sub stack, anywhere that I show up, uh, you can find there at jamescottbell.com. Very nice. Mr. Harvey, thank you kindly. Thank you. See you next week, perhaps? Yes, sir. As far as I know. Mr. Gilstrap, we'll see you on Monday. Monday. Very nice. Dave Ramsey's show is coming up next. Have a great day. If you're in line for early voting, be patient and uh, appreciate your energy and enthusiasm. This is Talk Radio, WRNR Martinsburg and TV 10. And we'll talk with you again in 22 short hours.